That Great Business Show, Ireland's Best Business Podcast. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 86 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 6th of May, 2022. I'm your host, Connell O'Moran. Coming up on your favorite business podcast, the boss of Kerrygold, Ireland's best-known food brand, is here to tell us everything you wanted to know about selling a simple commodity item to the world and winning. He might also tell us what happened to that horse that Kerrygold sent to France. And we bring you the Irish woman based in Denmark who's bringing her supermarket robots to a shop near you. And before we get to all of that, a further update on switching your business bank accounts from the soon-to-close Ulster Bank and KBC Bank. I told you I had started the process with Bank of Ireland. Well, I've also finished the process with Bank of Ireland. Much, much to my surprise, it was fast and it was painless. I now have a new business bank account. But mine is just one of the many, many hundreds of thousands of businesses that have to switch. So it did take some time to my new bestie, that's Bank of Ireland's best man in their Ballsbridge branch in Dublin, Glenn Moran, says, do it now. Do it now. And as always, this insider tip is brought to you by our best supporter, De Facto Shaving Oil. They make the world's best all-natural shaving oil in Mayo. And now that those Ryanair numbers suggest that many of you are heading away, De Facto is the ideal product to carry with you because you don't have to carry a can of shaving foam with you. De Facto is tiny, but lasts for months and does a much better job. Buy it now, DeFactoShave.com. De facto shaving oil, smooth as. So, what have Arivo in Riscommon, Harabon in Tip, Carberry, Dairy Gold in North Cork, Creameries all in Cork, Lanby in Kilkenny, Lakelands in Cavan, and Tipperary Co op in Tip all got in common? As shareholders of the Onua Co op, they're all behind Kerrygold Butter Brand. Probably Ireland's best known homegrown world brand. It's the number one in Germany, number two in the US, and number three, something called Butterblock brand in the UK. Their Pilgrim's Choice, which I have to admit I had never heard of, is, despite me, the number two cheddar brand in the UK. Or Nua itself was better known to many of us, either as the Irish Dairy Board or better still as Board by Ned before some. Genius. Change the name, but that's another story. Headquartered in Dublin, it is Ireland's largest exporter of Irish dairy products, exporting to 110 countries worldwide with annual sales of over 2.3 billion and a global team of 2,850 employees. So it's big and busy. And that's why I'm delighted that our new boss, John Jordan, a biotech graduate out of DCU, has found time to join Team GBS on That Great Business Show. John Jordan, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thanks, Colin. Delighted. Delighted to be here. So many questions and so little time, but let's start with a big question. Or no, or bored by now. Or no. And for me, the clarity, the timing for us, we changed to Ornua in April 15, which was the abolition of quotas. And for those in the daring world, they'll understand and know well that in 1984, Europe introduced milk quotas to Ireland. So if you're a farmer producing milk, you were capped in the output you could make. In April 15, that was abolished. And we thought that was an appropriate time to rebrand and rename the organization and move away from what people probably thought was a state or semi-state company of which we are not. And despite every effort you have made and all your great marketing and PR teams, every journalist that I know will always put in the uh, the, 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 the explanation, the Irish Dairy Board. Uh, they will. Um, I actually uh, talk about it to my friends about the mother test. Does your mammy know who you work for? And... Um, uh, or no, I suppose it's an unknown entity still in a lot of ways. Connell. I mean, uh, it's a great organization and, and I'm biased, so I'm going to say that. But given the scale and size of the organization, it's probably not very well known in Ireland to many people outside of maybe the, the, the agriculture and dairy world. 99.5% of our sales are outside of Ireland. It's a phenomenal it, success, though. It is. And um, uh, success... Uh, attributed to 60 years of a lot of people doing the right things for a long time. And I think one of the benefits of being a co-op, as opposed to another structure, maybe PLC or others, is time, time horizon. So um, our shareholders allow us to invest for the long term and want long-term sustainable growth. And and we've achieved that in some of the markets that, that you called out earlier. And that is a perfect segue because there are so many questions I want to ask you, but one of the things, and it's a bit of a bee in my bonnet and always has been, is the lack of success of co-ops. Now, yes, there have been successful co-ops, but we, 
used to, as in Ireland, used to own co-ops. Our Horace, Sir Horace Plunkett, more or less created the idea. Why is it not applied more widely than particularly successfully as it's done in dairy? Yeah, uh, uh, short answer, I don't know. Um, I, I would struggle to answer that. Um, and there's always a temptation to move away from it. Um, but why? It's a brilliant idea. It works. It works for you. It does work. Um, uh, and I think it's a great structure for the company. Um, and I think it brings a particular culture to it. Um, when we talk about it internally within our new we're very clear, though, that um, a cooperative structure is about your shareholders. When we're out facing to customers and consumers, we act and behave like any other business to try and maximize the value we create. So we look and behave like J&J or Unilever or Coca-Cola or anybody else. You then take that uh, money that and margin that you capture in the marketplace and how you distribute it then is the cooperative model. So it's actually the backward-facing part of it. I think it's a great model. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's a great model and a great place to work. Would you recommend it to others? Say, for example, we see, and I know I'm going off on a little tangent, but I do this a lot, is in the beef industry, many beef farmers give out yards about the price that they don't get because it is controlled by a handful of people. If they were to do a co-op model and to sell it like the Americans, and I'll get on to America because I know you served your time <laughs> over there, the Americans sell beef anywhere in a packet. You ship it and they sell it on a brand as well. Yeah, certainly in an Irish context, the beef sector and dairy sector are very different. Uh, beef is privately owned as a, as a processing uh, sector. Um, and it's predominantly private label or unbranded into food service. The beauty for the dairy sector is that we've developed a brand called Kerrygold that you called out. Ireland's first ever billion euro food brand. And the fantastic bit, and for all the marketeers that are out there, the fantastic and easy bit for us is that we don't have to create a story. And I love the example. If you take a packet of Kerrygold butter and put it on the table and open it up and take a packet of Land Lakes butter, in the US or Lurpak in the UK and put them side by side, our product is physically different. It's yellower. Yellower. It's actually softer. There's science behind it in terms of the texture. It's softer and it has a different taste. And all because the cow eats grass. And it's a really funny one. If you ask consumers around the world, what do cows eat? Every single consumer in the world in any part of the world will tell you grass. And they'll even, you know, you can do these things where you get them to draw pictures of a cow and they'll draw the like a kid would, a field of grass and a cow in it. The reality is there are two countries in the world where cows eat grass. And when I say eat grass, as the predominant source of their diet, that's Ireland and New Zealand. Pretty much everywhere else in the world, it's now grain. And it's a different texture and product, I gather, because I was reading an awful lot about butter in the last 48 hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I could talk, talk about it for 48 hours. Yes, it's, it's chemically, scientifically, physically different. So the makeup of it is different. And the pickup... And this is another thing I think, I don't know where I saw it, probably on your website. Tell me about how many packs are picked up in Germany every second? Well, every week uh, around the world, we sell, sorry, 11 million packets a day. Sorry, 11 million packets of Kerrygold a day sold, which is phenomenal. You think about it. Like, but you outsell Coca-Cola, I think, yeah, in Germany. So That's mind-bending. If you go to a supermarket in Germany and... Uh, think about the standing of the cash register and, and when you put the barcode through, the product will goes beep every time you put the barcode through. The most frequently scanned barcode in retail in Germany of food or drink is Kerrygold 250 gram packet butter. The single most frequently scanned barcode in German retail. Which is about 10 ounces, isn't that right? 250 grams. Gram, is, 250, yeah. 250 grams. Yeah, that's about 10 ounces. Yeah. Old ounces, yeah. Yeah. old money. Correct. Which is a then, phenomenal success. Now, my therapist talks to me a lot about this, or I pay him a lot of money for this. My concern would be, when will the dream end? I mean, that is just fantastic. And I know it's not going to end because you're sure. doing so many other things. Um, yeah, and look, if you think, when we think about our business, um, you know, what are the limitations to growth? So we're a very ambitious company. We've had phenomenal success in the last few years and phenomenal growth story over the last 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Um, I remember uh, back about 12 years ago, it was actually 2009 to 2010, we had a very serious meeting in Dublin and Germany was our big market at the time, still is a huge market for us. And the question was, where's our next Germany? You know, when we look out over the next 10 years, guys, where's the next Germany? Where do we invest and grow in? 
In 2020, the answer was Germany. We doubled our business. How did you do that? And this is now straight into you because this is what you have done for many years within the organization. And it's funny, this is the stuff I probably feel out of my depth answering, Connell, that, that, you know, that there are loads of people that do this and it's not me. But that is about um, a whole bunch of things. That's about first understanding the consumer and being really good about what the consumer wants. It's about making sure you have your existing product distributed really well. It's about bringing innovation and new products to the market. And then it's about the marketing layered on top of that that reminds people that they should frequently purchase those products and return to them. But every doctor and every cardiologist is telling us or has been have been telling us, I think they've changed their tune again recently, don't go near butter, that, that awful stuff. Do you remember margarine? Oh, yeah. my jeez. And again, so that's an interesting one. And I think it's a great example of where the consumer's at today. So if you go back through the 80s and 90s, Butter was a pariah. Margarine was the saviour for us all. You yep. could rub it on your heart and you'd yeah. feel great. <laughs> butter made the cover of Time magazine in, I, I again, stand to be correct, somewhere about 10 years ago. The cover of Time magazine was a packet of butter because science had caught up and said, well, we got that wrong, guys. Putting hydrogenated fats and oils into your body isn't that good for you. A natural product like butter that contains one ingredient, cream, might have a second one which is a bit of salt. It's one ingredient. In moderation, like everything, is fine for you. It's good. It's healthy for you. And it's an interesting one now when you move forward to today and people talk about alternative foods, um, almond milk, impossible burger, and will they stand the test of time? And I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, few years to see how consumers learn and grow and understand what those products are because it's a whole lot faster now than it was in the 80s and 90s social media being the obvious one, um, almond milk and and um, with the appropriate um, tone, I'd refer to it as almond juice. Okay, So why do people drink almond milk as an alternative to dairy? Is it because they think it's environmentally friendly? Is it taste? Is it an allergy? Um, and people, we need to understand why. It takes 6,000 litres of water to produce one litre of almond milk. And to produce one litre of milk? Um, I, geez, I don't know, but it's a fraction of it. It's a fraction of it. A fraction of it. So it can't be for environmental reasons. Is it for taste? Maybe. Is it for health reasons? It can't be. There's no nutritional value in it. So do you belong to some huge international milking organization that is trying to beat up oats and any of the other? I mean, I wouldn't touch those things myself, but that's just me. Uh, are you trying to... No. Is there not an educational process <clears throat> that you should be doing? If you were an American company, and again, I'll come back to you in America, you understand, by God, they just lobby. <laughs> They'll tell me, yeah. like the, I shouldn't even put cigarettes into the same uh, mouth, but you know what I'm saying. They yeah. spent billions proving, so-called, that cigarettes were good for you until they weren't. Yeah, I think as an organization and as a brand, we're not about denigrating others. So, that, no, that's Ornua. Yeah. But does Ornua belong? You probably so no is the answer your, to that. No, no, no there, there's no... Land the lakes there's no yourselves aren't on the phone every day or anything? No, no. there's no global milk uh, committee that sits behind a, a glass panel wondering how we'll undo <laughs> almond milk producers. Um, no, that doesn't exist. But as an organisation, uh, um, so we don't promote ours by denigrating others. I think that's not fair. It's not right thing to do. But there's a huge role about education and educating consumers about what they are eating in terms of what they're getting. Now, they can infer that, well, they're not getting it with other things. Um, but I think the consumer does a great job of that passion. The amount, you want to see the amount of social media comments and feedback we get on a daily basis on butter. On butter. Like, the, how passionate people are about Kerrygold butter that they're tweeting about it on a daily basis. Um, and does somebody have to collate all of this and give it to you at the end of the day or yeah. something? <laughs> no, I, I watch it myself. I spend <laughs> the day watching it. You know, I mean, you know... Like, think about the, the amount of products in your life, products, you know, brands in your life that you'd be that passionate about. Um, maybe for you, it's the de facto oil, um, that clean-shaven face you have. But It must but, be your favourite shaving oil as well. It absolutely is, yeah. <laughs> but think about how passionate would you be about a product that you engage with it in social media? And, and Kerrygold Butter has captured hearts, minds, and taste buds to do that. It's an amazing product. Again, so many questions, so little time. Why would anybody go into a supermarket in Ireland and buy Kerrygold at a chunk more money than buying own brand butter? Are all butters not the same? 
Uh, well, my short answer is definitely going to be no. All butters are not the same. Kerrygold is out there in its own. Now, I was wrong about this because I actually, again, I did a lot of digging about this. I couldn't find, I thought my, my dad, my late father, had taught me this thing about butter that once upon a time it was so corrupted as a product that there was legislation brought in somewhere in around the 1930s to make it actually standardised. Does that ring any bells? No. I thought, I, well, my dad was, anyway, he was, that was the way he was, so he was probably right about this. Anyways, I always thought that all butter in Ireland more or less came out of the same factory. Uh, it doesn't. And um, like any product, there's variability. And when we talk about Kerrygold, go back to the discussion we had at the start about it being yellow and soft and creamy. Um, there are criteria around the cream that we use and the process we use to make Kerrygold butter. We invested um, 40 million euro about four years ago to build a brand new state-of-the-art factory down in Mitchellstown that we own that processes the cream to produce Kerrygold butter. Um, we've just announced another 40 million to double the size of it. Um, so we're very particular about what goes into Kerrygold. There are times a year where it wor will work and won't work. So, you know, it has to be grass-fed. It has to be over the summer period. Uh, and there are very strict criteria. So not all butter is the same. You work in a business which has so many moving parts and so few parts that you actually control. I'm thinking of war in Ukraine. That's going to have an effect. Uh, um, uh, COVID in China is going to have an effect. Every moving part has an effect on you. Did I see yesterday, the day before, that uh, world milk prices have dropped by a chunk since the biggest drop since 2015? In a day yesterday, that was the, the uh, New Zealand auction. But yeah, it's funny, again, even reflecting on that, kind of like we go back to pre-COVID, go back, say, three years, and Brexit was the single biggest thing on our mind. And we had forums and committees and work streams of people from across the business focused on, on Brexit, scenario planning, worst case, middle case, best case, uh, working through it for, for literally 18 months. And it was massively occupying and it still didn't happen. And in the meantime, fine, they got resolution. But in the meantime, then we had the Trump tariffs in the US. We've had COVID. We've had the Suez Canal getting blocked and the, the knock-on impact that still suffers across, across supply chains today. Inflation, COVID, war in Ukraine. It's been phenomenal in terms of what every business has had to, to address in the last couple of years. And if I was to look back over those two years, the most amazing part of that is the agility that Ornu has shown. We've done all this while we've been mostly working from home which is an incredible result um, and shows the passion and resilience of the people and, and how they've been able to adapt. I laughed because I was reading the uh, annual report for 2020, which is things the last one published, and the chairman's statement was saying, and uh, he was looking forward to clarity on Brexit. And I said, well, good luck with that. Yeah. That year later, <coughs> a year and a half later, we still haven't got any clarity on that. Brexit, what does it mean to you at the moment? Now, I again, I was looking at 20 mile long tailbacks at uh, Dover and stuff like that. Is it still killing you in the UK? It's, it's interesting. So the scenario we had planned for was no tariffs and an increase in administration costs. And that is what's happened. So we're still exporting significantly to the UK. It's still a very important market. It's less than a quarter of our total sales, but still a very important market. We have four or five businesses there employing a thousand people um, and a very big focus on the market still. So our business costs of doing business have gone up, but we're really seeing the challenge actually trying to export out of the UK. So we have businesses based in the UK and we export as well. And it's become really difficult. And really where would difficult. you export to? Into the continental Europe or somewhere? Continental Europe or Africa, actually. Yeah, um, uh, a range of markets. And it's just become really, really challenging and really difficult. And tell me about the, the product that I had never heard of, Pilgrims. Where did that come from? And I didn't so, even know that Dubliners <laughs> belonged to Ornua either. Yeah. I see that in every supermarket, but I didn't know it belonged to you guys. So um, I'll answer those in reverse. Dubliner Cheese is a, a brand owned by Ornua and the cheese is, is produced by Carberry and West Cork. Um, uh, and sold in the Irish market and sold internationally. And let me ask you a question about that again, because I'm curious, George. If I went and bought a Carberry cheese, is there any difference at all in the product if I buy Dubliner's cheese? So Dubliner is a unique cheese. So Dubliner isn't a cheddar. It's a unique special recipe product made from scratch that Carberry developed. What is it? So, what, is it, what brand does it come under? I mean, Dubliner, yeah, but... It's, it's actually a marriage of... Um, Swiss Emmental, a um, bit of Parmesan and cheddar. So it's actually a very unique recipe. So it's, it's, it's a creative piece of work that, that Carberry did. And, well and done, Carberry. Okay, yeah, I didn't know yeah. that. Um, back to your other question in terms Pilgrim. of Pilgrim's Choice. So Pilgrim's Choice 
Um, so, Wait, where did the name come UK, from? UK brand. So um, it's a brand we actually bought from uh, an entrepreneur back in the late 90s, a guy called David Hardesty. And you can imagine the amount of cheddar that they eat in the UK. It's the, the biggest cheddar consumption market. It's the British, it's it? their cheese. <laughs> and uh, the number one brand is a brand called Cathedral City. And we're the number two brand. Um, a very difficult and different market to Ireland or continental Europe. Well, now talk to me about the differences, because again, people listening will say, mm, okay, they look and sound like us, so why would it be any different? Yeah, um, retail structure similar in terms of there are four retailers that dominate 80 plus percent market share, but they have a far greater focus on own label. So Tesco, Sainsbury's, uh, mm-hmm. Asda, Morrison's, it's really about their brands. And if you talk to a UK retailer, They'll say, everybody can sell Kerrygold Butter, everybody can sell Pilgrim's Choice, but only I can sell Tesco brand or I can sell Sainsbury brand. So their point of differentiation is their own label business. Whereas here in Ireland and still in parts of Europe, um, there's much more brand focus and much more balanced approach to it. And do you produce any own brand for any of the multiples? We do. We're the biggest private label cheese producer in the UK. But of course. <laughs> of course, why, yeah. Why did I not do this? <clears throat> yeah, so we have a, a fabulous facility in just outside Manchester. and uh, Manufacturing? It buys in bulk cheese and formats it. So if you picked up a pack of sliced cheese, grated cheese, or a block of cheese, cheddar mostly, in the UK, 40% of all of it in the UK is packed by us. And that actually brings me back to what I was saying earlier on about a term that I used that I didn't uh, know or understand. What is block cheese? Is that what it was called? Block butter, that was. I oh, think block butter, yeah. I beg your pardon. As block opposed butter. to um, spreadable product in tubs. So if you take the UK market, and again, it's a very interesting one in terms of um, our new and our history and our development. Um, back in the early 90s, um, we were equal number one in the market with Lurpak as a butter brand. Which is Danish, isn't that right? Correct. Yeah. And um, Lorpak launched a product in a tub that was butter fat and vegetable oil combined. So a spread. And we made the decision at the time, no, we're a dairy company. Damned with that vegetable oil stuff. And today they're 25 times bigger than us in the UK. <laughs> um, oh dear. <laughs> so a, a missed opportunity. Yeah. And again, it goes but back to... But you know what? I love people who actually, actually admit things. You know, we got that one wrong. But anyway, we did. But yeah, again... It, a lot of other things, right? The big lesson learned there is we didn't listen to the consumer. So the consumer wanted that product. But we said, no, that doesn't fit with Ornua. So if you make a decision that doesn't fit with you and you're not in touch with your consumer, be ready to lose out. And how have you rectified that now, say in the UK? We haven't, is the answer. So we've missed that boat completely. So. No, I mean, but since then? Yeah. Um, so we've tried a few times to launch a mixed fat product. Have and you? Arla are too big. Um, they have a dominant market share. Uh, own label exists in the same category and there isn't much room at the moment for Kerrygold. Do you hate them? No, <laughs> I don't. I don't. In fairness, look, they call that right. Um, um, uh, now, the UK we, is only 60 odd million people and uh, you have made big... Uh, looks to me that you're having a very good look, let me put it that way, at China, which would be 10, 20, 30 times bigger. Yeah, actually, um, one of the things I take a sharp intake of breath uh, when we do our strategic review and, and like every business, you sit down and put the feet up as a team and you say, you know, where are we going over the next three, four or five years? Um, the last time we did that out, uh, and presented it to stakeholders, shareholders, and indeed our board, a sharp intake of breath, which said China is not part of our strategic future as Ornua. And you sort of feel like, well, am I missing out there? Is there something we're not doing? Because everybody's going to the party in China. Everybody has a center, a center stage of their strategy. So why not us? And again, the answer is the consumer. So the consumer in China, and it's an amazing country, and I've only been a few times, that the, the benefit of being a few times, and people have um, incredible perceptions of what China is. And when I say China, I've been to Beijing and Shanghai, so that's not China, that's two global cities. But if you go up and down the supermarket aisles in, in either of those cities, the level of sophistication is light years ahead of where we are, way ahead. If you look at the yogurt category, they have brands, product type, packaging, innovation that we probably won't see for another 10 years. Incredibly sophisticated, incredibly um, well-run, really good brands. So you go back to what's the consumer eating? The consumer is eating fresh product, yogurt in particular, um, UHT milk, a lot of cream-based products, and infant formula. And Ornua doesn't produce any or much of those, 
And the ones we do are fresh and you can't ship halfway around the world. So we can't compete to win with the consumer in China. So we've decided it's not where we'll put our, put our a significant resource. Now, you say that you can't ship around the world, but uh, there is a, a, a bakery up in Donegal that you may have heard of. It's called Promise. And they, from Donegal, are the biggest gluten-free producer of bread in Canada. They ship from there over. Mm. It's mind-bending for me. Why could you not... Uh, say with cheese, freeze it and ship it, or cool Sorry, it che- and ship it. cheese you can, but they're not they're ma- massive. So again, if you think about Ireland produce, Ireland produce, Ireland's really good at producing butter and cheddar. Um, and when we met our original uh, distributor in China, it was really good. We sent out um, samples of butter, and they tried the butter and said, "Yeah, it's a great product." And then we sent out samples of cheddar, and the feedback came, "Yeah, it tastes great, but doesn't spread as good as the first one you sent us." <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, in terms of the product we produce, they're not. There is a market, but they're not in the same level of demand as yogurt, fresh cream cheese, um, those sort of products. So we don't produce those and can't can't compete producing those in Ireland out to China. We can produce butter and cheddar cheese and compete in a lot of markets, but what the consumer wants is fresh products. And you obviously know your markets and your business extraordinarily well. Is it possible, whether it's, again, I'm asking you to do a little bit of uh, future gazing here, in three years, five years' time, will that have changed, do you think, or is it just set, it's just the way it is, and they will not head that away? They may. Uh, I mean, what's interesting is the westernization of the fast food chains. Uh, If you talk to global pizza companies, Pizza, Domino's, Little Caesars, or McDonald's and, and Burger King, they are seeing huge growth in China, and it's actually of the Western-style products. So it's interesting that uh, cheddar on cheeseburgers, uh, mozzarella on pizzas, will become pervasive and will come into the diet outside of those fast food chains in time. And didn't or doesn't the cheddar on a burger, a McDonald's burger, come out of Mitchellstown? Was that it used to be anyway? Um, it, it's not. Um, there are two companies that, that have a very significant chunk of McDonald's. Kerry is one and Schreiber is the other. Okay. I'm going to hold you there, John Jordan, who's CEO of Ornobis. We have to actually go and have an ad break and tell the world about great things about de facto and other great brands. But we will be back to you in just a second. You're listening to That Great Business Show. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Rate and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms, or legs nick free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. And I'm here with John Jordan, who is CEO of Ornua. John, you recently got a facility up, when I say recently, a while ago got a facility for 500 million euro. People who take out facilities normally intend spending them. Where is half a billion euro going to be spent? Yeah, and uh, again, you're calling out your sponsors and, and acknowledging them. Um, look, the support we get from our banking syndicate is fantastic. Um, and it's Irish and international banks. And I think it's actually back to that where you started out. It's one model where banks uh, understand and appreciate the co-op model and see Ornua as its role that it plays with shareholders and in particular actually working capital. So um, unfortunately at the moment there's a very significant growth in working capital requirement. Um, As we're producing product, dairy markets have risen um, dramatically in the last uh, nine to 12 months. By how much? Um, heading for double in some cases. Oh, yeah. Oh, bo. Yeah. Double. Like 100%. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Now, hang on. I'm always looking for a headline. <laughs> Does this mean that there's going to be a whopping big price increase on either butter or cheese in Ireland? Uh, you're already seeing it in Ireland. Um, so it has started to come through. Um, if you look at um, 
you've probably seen about a 25% price increase, 25 to 30% price increase in butter on shelf in Ireland in the past number of weeks. Um, and the way prices are going, that won't suffice. There'll be margin squeeze for retailers, margin squeeze for, for suppliers like us. Um, and likely still further price increases down the so road. So again, a bit of a bit of few, a bit more of futurology, please. How much more? Um, I would say there's another twenty five percent to go. Ow. Yeah, and now, again, it's, it's if prices go up like that, people start saying, "Well, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to eat my bread without any butter or something." Yeah, I mean, and and there's a real concern. Um, so, sorry, I'll start that again. Dairy markets are volatile. So, you know, Very. I was looking at them. They're well, commodities. How, how do you work with that? It's mad. Yeah, and and that that there's a degree of um, risk management required within that, but they're volatile. They rise and they fall, um, and quite cyclical. Um, and it's a global product, so it's about global supply and global demand. The challenge at the moment is demand is reasonably robust and supply is constricted. Supply is harder to turn on to increase. And therefore, if demand stays up, what we're seeing at the moment is very high prices and they're sustained. Um, and it's unusual that it's across all products. Normally, it's either the fat or the protein would be high and the other one would be low. At the moment, everything's high. It's also further compounded by things like shipping costs, the inflation costs around energy. All of those, you know, I don't like the phrase, but that perfect storm of costs uh, is putting huge pressure on but business. it is. It really is. It is. And even back to farmer level, you know, farmers talk about feed, fuel and fertiliser, the increase in costs at farm level are dramatic. And if you think about the supply chain, their input costs have gone up. Fine, milk price has risen, but it's not about the absolute milk price, it's about the margin they can make on it. And it's not sufficient globally to drive more milk production. Um, so us as consumers are likely to see significant inflation, not just in, in, in dairy, but in all of food uh, over the next, I would say, six to 12 months. And shortages? Uh, shortages... Um, no, I would. I wouldn't. No, I don't particularly see panic and shortages. Stop my carry gold. No, feel free to <laughs> feel free to. Um, no, I, it, that wouldn't be our concern. Our concern is around inflation. Now, then it does go back to the point you made, Connell, that you know, as prices rise, how does consumer behaviour change? Um, do I eat a bit less? Do I switch to an alternative? Um, the issue in, in terms of butter, for example, is the alternative might be vegetable oil or margarine, but they're all gone up as well. So the, the relativity is there. You also then get to consumer behaviour. If eating out has become very expensive and driving to a restaurant and eating out, what happens is consumers eat more at home, but because you haven't gone out, you tend to indulge a little bit. You buy a slightly better bottle of wine, you buy a bit of extra cheese and have a bit of a cheese board or something, or whatever you do, or you buy that better steak. So it's, it's in an inflationary cycle, again, it's actually food service could be hit and a bit of indulgence for retail shopping. Oh dear, not looking great, not sounding great, is it? Look, again, they're challenges that we all face. And, and again, they're not unique to Ornua or unique to dairy. These are challenges that every food producer in the world is facing today. You worked in the States. I want you, because we love doing this, to talk to me for, on behalf of the listeners, Team GBS, because I want them to leave listening to the podcast knowing more about how to sell to the Americans, no matter what you are selling. But you literally earned your stripes over there. The do's and the don'ts, please. Yeah, um, I have a huge fondness for the US. Um, I did two stints there. I did five years uh, on the team selling Kerrygold brand of product into retail. I came home and did a further three years in a business we have that's in distribution. And that fondness is in part because my third son was born over there. So we went out with two kids and came home with three. So we, we own a little yank at home uh, who's just turned 16. And he's a very proud American as well. So a, a real special place in our family uh, in terms of the US. I love working there. I think it's a great place to work. So if anyone on, uh, uh, listening out there wants to... Uh, broaden their wings, um, enjoy a challenge, go to the US and uh, why not go to the US for our new... Uh, um, Actually, on that, because I was looking at the website, you're looking for a brand manager for Kerry Gold, aren't you? We're, we're always looking for good people. There are 36 uh, vacancies just in du on the Dublin uh, pages. They didn't even go into the other ones. But I, there it was, was winking at me, was saying, brand manager Kerry Gold. We were thinking of applying. It was only a, It was only posted four days ago, five days ago, correct? Yeah. Correct, correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a lovely job for somebody. Indeed. Um, and we've plenty of lovely jobs. <laughs> to back it up, like, the US for me, it's very clear cut. Uh, I, I think they're great to deal with in terms of uh, the clarity that they bring. So you go and talk to a retailer and you do your pitch and say, we're interested in putting this and they'll say yes or no. 
and it happened. There's very little maybe, what if, come back next week. It's, it's, it's a simple place to do, to do business in many ways. But the no's you didn't want to hear. So how did you, John Jordan, make sure you got fewer no's than yeses? Um, again, so there's a few bits in that for me at that basic level. I'll go back a level first though, maybe Colin, in terms of exporting. What I hate to see and what I really dislike is Irish companies saying, I've, I'm exporting to the US. And what you find is they met a distributor at a food fair in New York or Los Angeles and they've agreed to carry our product. And then you'll see a headline here, Company A has a listing in Whole Foods. In, it doesn't work. Why? If you don't do it, it won't happen. If you go to a distributor, you're one of a thousand or in, in the distributor we own, you're one of 45,000 items. Whoa. So the salespeople in those one distributors. One distributor was distributing 45,000 items. Correct. So you're lost. You're lost within it. A salesperson within that distribution company can't focus on yours. So if you're passionate about your product and passionate about and deliberate about wanting to build an export market, US Rani, go and own it. Go put a person on the ground. Go get someone to look after your business. Put a person on the ground, fine. But first of all, it is a huge, huge continent. Yeah. And how do you get from A to B? How do you knock on the door of a Whole Foods? How do you go? How do you choose New York versus Chicago versus San Francisco? And again, um, you have to go back and, and just do that bit of study. So we did that. and, and But you had a big organization behind you. Maybe not at, not the time, as big. At, the, at the time. Like in, 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 um, in the late 90s, Roisin Hennerty moved from the Dublin office to Chicago. She was a one-woman band for the Kegel business in the US. One person. She went out and she started that and got that traction. Today, working solely on Kegel, we've over 60 people. But again, you say, okay, well, who's the customer going to target? How am I going to make that win? Am I going to target Whole Foods or Costco? How do I get consumers to buy the product? We spent most of our money in the early days getting people to sample it. We spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions, doing loads of in-store demonstrations because we were convinced the product quality. And as soon as people taste it, they said, oh, actually, there's something different. And that's how we did it. But that, you know, we're, we're an overnight success in the US after 20 years. And a massive investment. Yes. Is it too big? Is it impossible for a small Irish company? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And again, the, the fragmentation, and again, we're talking retail, the fragmentation of retailers in the US makes it a great opportunity. So you can actually go to um, the Northeast and find a retailer that just operates in the Northeast, Hannaford Brothers, and do a listing with them and you can get some business. You could go to San Francisco and find Lucky's. They're just in San Fran and do business with them. Or you can say, I'm going global and go at Walmart. You know, th there's both ends of that. And knocking on the door, say a Walmart. Again, when you were knocking on the Walmart door, you did have an organization that may not have been sure. huge by American standards, but at least they listen, do they? Or what's the secret? Give us a little secret about, do you, did you look for an O'Murphy or an O... No. Uh, no, no. And we weren't selling to the Irish consumer. Mm -hmm. We were selling to the foodie. Oh, was that you thinking more about trying to get in the door of the buyers? Yeah. Well, um, it's interesting. We were um, uh, there was a few of us over in Walmart last week. We met with the senior team there, and they called Ornu out as a world class supplier. And the reason for it was they said you understand the consumer, and you understand the importance of creating consumer demand within our stores. And I think that's been our philosophy from the start. You can get a listing in the US, so you can get product on a shelf, but that's no good to you to the retailer or anybody. You need to understand who the customer is and how you're going to get that consumer to take it off the shelf. The rest take care of, take care of itself after that. Again, I, were it that simple? Because just thinking of the supply chain, do you ship container loads of butter over to? We ship containers upon containers upon containers to New York to... Um, They're obviously uh, cooled in some fashion, are they? Uh, frozen. So yeah. we ship it frozen to New York, to Florida, to Texas, and to Los Angeles. And do you have distribution centers there for your, of your own? Third party. Okay. Everything third party. So again, you know, and fine, that's an infrastructure we've built up over time, but that, that's third party. We outsource all that. And in the early days, I presume that it's easier just to go East Coast or something, is it? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's physically closer as well, yeah. Which helps. Yeah. It does. And the business areas are useful as well. Yeah, look, it, it, on any of these things, you know, and, and the US is no different to any market, 
It's about being deliberate about your strategy. You know, what are you trying to achieve? If you're really deliberate about growing your business and passionate about doing it, you need to spend time on the consumer and on the customer and on your supply chain. And you're now heading way, way, way from America. You're going to the Middle East. What have you found there? Yeah, um, we've been in the Middle East for quite a while, but, it's, but um, again, one of the beauties of working for a company like Arnu is you get to see parts of the world uh, uh, compare and contrast. Um, as I say, the US is a very easy place to do business. We do a lot in the Middle East. We do a lot in Africa. Um, Middle East is a very wealthy part of the world um, in terms of a consumer that's buying Kerrygold. Um, there is a um, growing demand, uh, again, for westernized product. Um, it's been interesting in terms of, uh, certainly in terms of COVID, because that's changed the dynamic in the market there where um, a lot of expats, uh, particularly in the construction sites, food service side, went out, didn't uh, le left, and, and they're slowly coming back. Oil obviously has a huge uh, role to play in, in somewhere like the Middle East in terms of the higher the price of oil, the more affluent, the more money that, f that trickles down. Middle East is an exciting market for us in terms of showing growth. If I was to say, um, not to overplay it, but if I was to say looking out over the next 10, 20 years and look at the future executive teams of Ornu and where, where will they be saying, thank God the team of 2022 invested some money in, it's probably Africa, the continent of Africa. Big place. It is. Uh, and I said the continent of Africa. Um, our second biggest cheddar market outside of the UK. So second biggest cheddar market that we export is Algeria. How did you break into, how did you find Algeria? Now you're nodding, yeah. for anybody who can't see him, he's nodding kind of knowingly, but there's always a story, isn't there? There is, and, and again, for us, um, you know, some of these are people we met at food fairs, like as I said, uh, trying to describe the UK, some we fell across, but um, again, a lot of it's deliberate. So they're a huge, they're one of the biggest importers in the world of dairy products, the Algerians, they consume huge amounts of it. So again, it, if you just ranked, who buys dairy products in the world and put those markets up there? You know, our strategy at a, at a point in time was, well, let's make sure we're in those markets and how do we, how do we establish a, foot, a foothold? Um, we have a, a facility in Nigeria um, that packs powder. So we sell Irish powder product out there, pack it in Kerrygold tins and sachets and, and sell it in the, in the market. Again, a really exciting place to be when you look at the growth of consumption in Nigeria. These sorry, that powder is coming from? Ireland. Yeah. So it's um, milk powder. And again, really interesting that, you know, people understand, you say, well, okay, milk powder is milk powder. What are they doing with it? So people might take a spoon of powder and stir it in their tea. They might reconstitute water to make milk for, for cereal. Uh, it gets used for production of yogurt a lot. So people make yogurt at home. And even um, there's a product called the lick. It's a great term, the lick. It's a 10 gram sachet. So imagine the and times, yeah. size, of a, size of a postage stamp nearly. And um, when you're in the traffic in Lagos and traffic is chaotic and you're stuck a lot of times, there are people who walk down through the cars with a board and they're selling sunglasses or mobile phones or bottles of water or they sell 10 gram sachets of milk powder. And it's called a lick because you take the 10 gram sachet, open it and literally lick it, the dry powder, because people understand the nutritional hit they're getting from, from that little And is that branded powder. Kerrygold? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Who came up with the idea of that? Um, again, look, uh, that's following consumers and where it comes from, you know. No, but somebody sat down to say, we're going to make a lick. Oh, no, the locals call it a lick. The, oh, local, okay. the, the local phrase is You've the lick. You've got some fancy words for it, yeah. you? No, no, just weird. <laughs> it's a 10 gram sachet. Nothing more complicated than that. Yeah. Oh, so many questions, I say. I have to ask you this one. Just looking around on the backstory to uh, Orno and or uh, by name, I noticed that the name Tony O'Reilly is kind of missing. What's the history there? As in, I, when I was a kid, he was the brains behind Bordbina as it was. Yeah, and um, I had the great pleasure of actually meeting him a couple of years ago. Um, he was in Ireland and I, I drove down to, to meet him and we had lunch together. Um, a really, really interesting character. And the, the most striking point for me was the passion he still had for the Kerrygold brand. It was incredible. Did he invent the Kerrygold brand or is that kind of... No, he did. So um, he was 25, 26, um, Irish international rugby player, and he was the first CEO of Board Banya at the time. And um, th we've loads of documents in history within our note, but they actually uh, developed... There was two good stories, but one is they developed the Kerrygold brand to launch into the Liverpool and Manchester markets. 
That's a start somewhere. And imagine today's <laughs> world that you create a product that you're launching into Liverpool and Manchester market. Like people would look at just sideways. So e- even the scale of that w- was interesting. And the other story they tell is that, you know, when, when he launched it, um, the board of Ornu at the time, he had to present to them and um, uh, it was, there's, and we have the photograph, there were um, the Kerrygold um, ladies, um, the sort of air hostess looking type ladies that came in to present the product, give out samples. And apparently one of the directors at the time said, well, if that's marketing, I'll have more of that. Oh, um, you wouldn't get away with that? You certainly wouldn't. Um, you certainly <laughs> wouldn't get away. But again, look, I mean, again, great foresight in terms of understanding that there was a premium to be had for Irish dairy products exporting it. And um, did he give it the name Kerrygold? Do you he did. believe he yeah. did? Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's fact, he did. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, he was CEO at the time and the team that sat around and they, they had... <laughs> He's cr- he we, grabbed it anyway. We like have, he used to grab a ball. We have the documentation where they looked at the, you know, Leprechaun was another brand name they had at the time. Oh, thanks be to Jesus. That um, didn't what happened, yeah. Crock of Gold. Th- yeah. There was a whole lot of uh, twee ones, but uh, thankfully they picked on Kerrygold and it's, and it's resonated. And we're almost out of time. And our last question always to all our guests is, who would John Jordan hire in a heart? Connor Crowley, who works with Arbor Investments in the US. Good cork man. Why? Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Connor previously. And um, I always admire um, smart people. I think it's a great starting point. So he's a very intelligent man, um, but able to practically implement that into a business and simplify things and make things happen. Um, he's he's obviously account- helped you. An account, yeah, he has absolutely, and, and an accountant by training. Um, so a good numbers guy, but very commercial and practical around it, and uh, helped me a lot in terms of simplifying my approach to businesses. That's a nice thing to be able to say. Conor Crowley of Arbor Investments. Yeah. He's hired. <laughs> John Jordan, continued success at Orden or Noah. It is a fantastic story. It continues to be. I didn't even ask you about the dairy cows and what they're doing to the atmosphere, but we leave that to kind of more hard-nosed news programs. We're interested in business. That is a fantastic business news, about business uh, story. And thank you very much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Make one small switch. Switching from shaving foam to all-natural de facto shaving oil will give you the smoothest, softest shave ever. Switching from shaving oil to de facto helps stop 20 million non-recyclable shaving foam cans go to landfills every year. Switching from shaving oil to de facto will save your skin, your pocket and your planet. DeFactoShave.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. That great business show. We've done a bit over the episodes about the importance of clustering in industry. Now, here's a great example of that idea in action. Odunza, or Odenza, some people might call it, the third largest city in Denmark with a population of 180,000, so it's not much bigger than Cork, has worked hard over the years to make itself a centre of excellence for robots and robotics. That's why my next guest, Kiana Martin, lives there. With an engineering degree out of TU Dublin, a robotics degree from University of Limerick, as well as a master's in advanced robotics, it's fair to say, if Kiana hadn't gone to Odunza, then Odunza would have come to her. She, for the last almost four years, has been the driving force behind Coalescent Mobile Robotics, or CM Robotics. I think it stands for Tina Martin Robotics, but we'll talk to her about that. It's a start of developing new technologies using robots specifically in a retail. If you look at their website, you will see that Tina's robots do mundane but necessary and repetitive tasks in supermarkets. And I'm so delighted that Cleana isn't in Odunza today, but she's in Dundrum, Dublin today, in our studios to talk to me about how she dreams of robots. Cleana Martin, welcome to That Great Business Show. Hi, Connell. Thanks very much for having me. It's been a tr- bit tricky to get you down here, <laughs> but we have, and we've failed twice, but I think we've finally got you. So I'm so happy about that. You dream of robots. Well, I would say for the last four years, it's been pretty consistent on my mind, all right? Why? What made you? What tickled you? You said robots must be it. Um, it could have been building bridges. 
Yeah, I don't think I uh, started off with robotics. You know, I started off mechanical and then I did, um, I went for, to work for Boston Scientific and did a course there in PLC program, which showed me, um, you know, simple programs could make machines do things. So that kind of triggered my... Uh, I'm sorry, when you saw that the first time, did you actually kind of get it? Woohoo, this is exciting. I was just like, uh, um, I just I just thought it was interesting because when you're when you're at school, you're kind of taught like that the ones that you can choose are electrical, mechanical and I don't know, become a plumber or something. You know what I mean? And so robotics wasn't that new then. So you didn't know anything about software programming, didn't know anything about a lot of things. And so it was just kind of going... Just That's school for you, isn't it? You didn't know lots of it, lots of things. Yeah, yeah you need to, uh, yeah, you need to, yeah, you need, you need to go out and figure it, like find things out and then just follow the career path as it goes. And uh, so that course led me to thinking about robots and then I came back and studied robotics. And for me, robots are those things that you might see in Star Wars or one of those, you know, kind of walking around with like looking like humans, but which always has made me look a bit, I thought, stupid because uh, why do they have to look like humans? Anyway, yours do not look like humans. Tell me what your robotics do or your robots do. So I've been working with mobile robots for over 10 years now and initially working in a warehouse based, which is just the transportation of goods from one location to another. Um, and so I followed in that path, but we decided to go into the retail industry because we, we there was already quite a few mobile robotics companies in the warehouse industry, so it's more competition. Um, and then one of my friends was working with the uh, in a supermarket stocking shelves, and she was saying that she was transporting trolleys from one location to another. And she's small, um, and these trolleys are like 180 kilos. And she was working from 12 at night till 8 in the morning with no break, you know, pushing these these trolleys, and uh, it wasn't very nice. And so I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> So like the mobile robot basically drives under a trolley and the trolley can have either stuff for restocking, which happens after hours, or now because of the pandemic and it's after becoming popular, it's a click and collect, so online order fulfillment. So literally the robot, little little car drives under the trolley, an actuator goes up, catches the trolley and it just pushes it to another location. And it, I've seen the videos, it looks beautifully simple. I presume it's not beautifully simple. And if it is beautifully simple, somebody else presumably will come along and make something very similar. So um, it looks I like the beautiful because we actually designed the robot to fit the retail industry branding and identity standards. So the mobile robots that are currently out there for warehouses aren't beautiful. So ours are like designed for that. Well, now, to be fair now, it looks like if anybody has seen a vacuum, a robot vacuum or something, it just goes underneath, lifts up, I think, does it? Yeah. And then goes... Yeah. I, I do a lot of sound effects here. Yeah, it's fine. So I do that again. Yeah. And it goes from A to B and then drops down and then you unstack and then presumably goes off again. Yeah, so... Um, uh, so... So just to touch base on that, there's a the PDA system, so it's just like a phone. You know, you scan a trolley and you'll just say if it's empty or full and then you'd say where it needs to go and what it has and then the robot does the... and then... Picks it up so and I made the right sound. Good. <laughs> and then, uh, and then from the from the functionality perspective, it's uh, it looks simple, but like, um, the, and one of the main differences for us moving from warehouse to retail is that we have unpredictable humans there that are shopping. So in a warehouse industry, it's usually focused on. Uh, the only people that are in that environment are people that are working there. So you can train them to be careful of, of robots, right? When that noise goes off, beep, 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 beep. Yeah. This is brilliant. This is the best uh, interview I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but then, you know, like humans in a supermarket are super unpredictable. So it's like, it's very difficult to get them to work in that environment. So I am in my local supermarket and uh, your robot is there carrying the, my mush the mushrooms or whatever. And it sees me. Yeah. Does it stop? Does it move away? Oh, what does it do? How does it, it know I'm there? So it has. So basically, a robot will have you. You can well, you can configure it to do whatever you want, right? So you have to you have to be very close to your customer and very close to your product, so that you can look at how it behaves, and then you'll adapt that behavior to the robot. Um, and so you can have different zones of closeness that a person can be to the robot, and it will react differently. So if it's like whatever three meters away, and it starts to see you and sees you coming closer to it, then it might just alter its path and it'll go towards driving around you but then if you come towards the critical zone uh, it will stop the, well, just before the critical zone it will probably it'll like more likely stop but then there's a zone 
that it just shuts off all the power to all, all, all the motors and all the electronics inside because it's just like, no, this is too close, too dangerous, stop. Um, if you step out of that, then it'll restart it and then it'll move again. So there's there's different, different uh, functionalities depending on how far. And what about that other question that I was asking that maybe it, sh- it gives you a shiver rather than a dream? Somebody else will come in and just replicate what you're doing. So I think that can happen in any any industry and any technology. Um, I think that uh, we ha- we've there's currently no one doing what we're doing at the moment. We've had two to three years ahead uh, head start from them, and we've focused specifically with supermarkets. So we've done an awful lot of learning with regards to how the supermarkets operate. Um, we've got good relationships with them, and we know a lot about. Uh, things that go on in a supermarket. And so every anybody that comes in will have to do that. And who owns or where do you hide or store away that IP? So that, that well that's not really IP like the, the the mobile robot we've got an we've made an uh, a patent application for the uh, the coupling mechanism but actually the process and stuff like that is much too difficult. But the knowledge that you have about yeah. supermarkets and how supermarkets actually work. Yeah. Is that not proprietary to you? I mean, it's yeah, but I do, you can't. I don't know. Like, I don't know about patenting it. Okay, but it's because you are raising money, and I presume when people are asking you about this, you're raising how much? Well, in at the end of the year, end of year, uh, beginning of next year, we're looking to raise eight to ten million euros. That's a chunk of money. Yes, <laughs> you've got. You already have one point six seven or yeah. something like that in the back pocket. Yeah. And what will you spend the next load of money on? Um. So. Uh, from the development perspective of the company, this year it, uh, it's focused on our first customer, Saling Group, which is the biggest supermarket chain in Denmark. And there, it's on making uh, like the uh, making sure that the lower level control of the robot, so it's tech, uh, it's tech focused, is deterministic. So that means that it, to be safe, you need to be able to know exactly when things are happening. So that's determinism. And so, uh, so we focus on that. And next year, again, the money will go towards increasing the development team. So we want to scale the team by 20, 20 engineers uh, to, you know, to scale the product into different countries. Oh, okay, we'll get on to the different countries in a second, because <laughs> the first thing that you said there was that you have already got or you're working with the largest retailer in Denmark? Yes. Yeah. How did you get that? Persistence. <laughs> well, talk to me, because people need and want to know. Did you stand outside the head of technology or something in this uh, supermarket chain and just keep knocking on the door? Yeah, like they... they uh I mean, I have a very good relationship with them and I had never done like any dealings with corporate, right? So I was like a little terrier and they were like a big Doberman or something, you know, with the relationship that we had. But I initially went up to them. So initially when we decided to go after supermarkets, we went to all the supermarkets in Odense to do uh, user user experience observations and things like that to see how we could show value to them. Um, and then supermarket chains, for those people who don't know, you have a main main parent and then you have different uh, supermarkets underneath in 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 Denmark a selling group who we're working with has one called Bilka Fertex and then Netto and we're working with Bilka which is the hypermarket so we went up to then the uh, the store managers in um in Bilka and we were like can you connect us to your to the higher powers in selling group and they were probably like who the hell is this little thing you know and then uh, so then I and went what was that conversation what happened during those conversations? They just ignore you, like. <laughs> so okay, that, that's the truth. Yeah. yeah, well, it is like so. It's like okay, then and then fair enough. You know what I mean? Because they don't know who you are or anything. So, um, you, so you have to take the time to build that trust. Um, and so, well, what did you do? Go by uh, in buying a pint of milk every day and saying, "I'm back, I'm back, I'm back." Yeah. So with them, I gave up on them because they were. It's a they. They weren't going to be able to make the decision. So I had gotten whatever information I needed at that stage, right, to be able to prove the business case. And then I went and started just cold calling selling group. And for me, like one of my one of our investors, Niels Jules Jacobson, and uh, my mentor, like my mentor for a good few years now, a very, very nice guy. He basically told me that and he's the founder of one of the biggest mobile robotics companies in the world. Uh, sold for over 300 million euros. But he basically told me that um, if I didn't have a customer, I wouldn't have anything. So my mentality when I was approaching them was like, if I don't get them, I have nothing. You know, so then I was like ringing up above and I, like I wanted Denmark because it's right, like like I was living there. So it's like 
the easiest option. And Bilka um, was the the supermarket that we wanted. We wanted to go to after hypermarkets. So they were the only option. You know what I mean? So it was like, I have to get someone in there to talk to me. And so I rang them, like I went through HR, went through loads until someone said, oh, Okay, you know. So, and what did they say? Okay, too. Did did you manage to get a pitch at them? And did they say, okay, yeah, I like the sound of that. Now, so one other question built into that: you've already told me that your Danish is not exactly world class. Yeah. So, what language were you speaking with them? At English. Because yeah. you were telling me that that's the kind of lingua business. Yeah, yeah, you can speak it. Yeah. yeah, English is like the Danes and the Nordics are just excellent at English, so you get away with it. So you ring them up and you say, hi, this is Kleena, and what was the pitch? Oh God, it was so long ago. Like, uh, I think I talked to one guy who was in the logistic company and what you usually do is when you find someone that thinks you're it's interesting, you send them an email because they'll just forget so we just sent them an email and said, like, we're looking at uh, probably something along the lines of we've done some research and we found that if we automate uh, the trolleys for your restocking process, we can offer you whatever, whatever value. And so we were we had the, we, we had done the research and stuff like that. So they were like, OK, fine. So then they rang me. So this guy told another guy, Thomas, who is now my go to guy in selling group, uh, you know, this might seem interesting. So I rocked. So they invite me up. So they ring me first, ring me back. And I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, okay, come up. And so I came up. I went up without even a presentation (laughs) because we didn't have anything to present, you know. And I just went up and then uh, there was myself and four or five guys, you know, in the logistics. And I was just like... Yeah, we're gonna we're 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 thinking a bit. We're building a robot, mobile robot to transport trolleys, you know. So no presentation, nothing. And I was like, yeah, if it happens, would you be interested? And they'd be like, yeah, if you can make it happen, we'd be interested. And so then going from nothing, you know, I kept I, I didn't I kept them updated, but now I had I had started that relationship, right? And then the one 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 important thing in in this was just to consistently deliver. So. Uh, I started with nothing, then went to the next step where, you know, I went up with a presentation. Then they saw the first robot Pumba and then the second one and so on. So there was, they could see, you know, that we were moving, you know, relatively fast and and delivering. A little lesson I was taught by a guy called Porik Slattery, who always taught me or told me, inform as you perform. So basically, as you reach milestones, tell people about it because they uh, yeah. they, they can't second guess. They can't say, yeah. are you woman cleaner? She, she's uh, playing golf or whatever, yeah. And also not to over-inform, right? It's like, don't, you know, well, from from my perspective, it was just like, don't be a nag in, in a kind of, you know, like, it's just like every, like when you have something substantial, then just say, oh, check this out. And that's how I think with all our investors and all the relationships that we've built throughout this company has just been to keep them around and not to, pressure them and then uh, and then they and then they've spent that time looking at you seeing how you deliver building that trust that when you actually end up needing them you've done the work without coming across as desperate <laughs> and where are you now with your robot so 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 like this like we actually only of officially signed the contract with these guys in uh, a month ago or so when we uh, you and I were on the phone and you told me you can't come down to Dublin because you're signing a contract. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was delighted for you. Yeah, good news. Yeah, so that was that's like a three hundred thousand kroner, a uh, three hundred thousand euro contract uh, for a first contract for a startup that's f- less than four years old. It's nice. There's a big. <laughs> smile on Cleaner's face. Yeah. You possibly had a drink that night, did you? Oh, I'd say I had a few, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now that reality is now reset in, what's next? What do they expect to see next that so, you haven't told them yet? So basically... They'll be listening to this podcast, you know. Uh, yeah, well, they might, yeah. <laughs> I'll make sure they're there. Yeah. Uh, I, I like, I'm, I'm quite honest and transparent anyway, so it's all good. But uh, basically, um, the engineering team now has to deliver on those so the supermarket is not putting uh, any constraints or like deadlines on us but internally we need those deadlines because we already sold selling group to the first bunch of investors and now we're going for the second bunch bunch of investors so we can't resell them that same story can you make a, or have a relationship and sell your robots to rival uh, retailers in Denmark or do you have to kind of go further afield so that you're not seen as uh, dumping on them? So we don't actually, actually there's, there's so in Denmark there's two supermarket chains, the leading ones, Saling Group and Co-op, but Co-op do smaller stores who are actually not 
interested in them just yet because uh, we don't we could probably provide them value, but we can provide more value to hypermarkets. So that's our focus. Um, and also for from an investment perspective, like if we want to go for the 8 to 10 million, you need to show internationalization. So of it's like or instead of focusing in Denmark, it's better to put your time and your focus on outside Denmark for the second customer. So who has the big supermarkets or hypermarkets that you're looking for? Because the Lidl's and the Aldi's don't because their model is small units. Yeah, correct? so like um, Tesco's or Sainsbury's, Asda in the UK. So we're going after the UK and we're going after France as well, Auchan, Carrefour, uh, oh, they're huge. Leclerc. Yeah, yeah th- those type of, and those, 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 those chains are huge. Like, you know, so getting in there, it's like uh, hard work. Um, How many robots per large store? How, what, what do you promise the, the, the retailer that you'll, you're going to save them? What's all, what's all the business parts of so, that? So like, um, I don't probably like so a minimum ten mobile robots, but then we do in one unit in, in yeah. one store, yeah. yeah. But we would we would um, so based on Bilke and Saling in our research there, we say like we can save about fifteen minutes per pallet load of products in the restock and process. But the humans have to still at the end uh, and at the beginning, yeah. yeah. Have to load. Yeah. Are you working on that yet? No, <laughs> not yet. That's uh Oh yeah, that's like there's so much other potential that would be easier than that in a supermarket because that's need you need a lot of dexterity in a robot for that and it's <laughs> gets slow. expensive. Yeah. yeah so, um, yeah. So, uh, what I was asking you was about the numbers that will uh, need yeah. to go into a store, and then you save them 15 minutes per pallet load of products. Okay. So, like a, a hypermarket could have like. Depending on the size, right? A small hypermarket, maybe 300 to 500 pallets per week, maybe more, depending on whether you consider the electronic side of it or just the standard foods that go out. So so we, so, so we give this pitch and then also... So, in, say 100 hours a week? 125 hour, or like hours, 100, yeah, 100 so, hours a week. So, say uh, three uh, days, sorry, three week, weeks work or 48 hour, 40 hour weeks, three people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's safe, and it works, and it works at night. Yeah, so it's 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 it's, it's a huge market. It's uh, but, I have but so, now about the hugeness of the market. Yeah. I presume, as you lay on your bed on Odunse, am I saying that correctly? Oh, <laughs> Odunse, but anyway, Odense, oh, But they probably give out about the way I say it, so I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> is how big is the big market? As in, like, if we go and move towards the states and all. How vast is it? And have you got any competitors, real competitors? So it, so if you look at the, like, if I remember off this off my pitch deck, it's like a 14 trillion uh, food market. And then we're going after a hypermarket. So that's 10 billion euros uh, possibility because there's like 12,000 uh, 12, plus. Now, 10 billion euro or dollars, whichever. Yeah. Of what? Of putting 10 mobile robots in uh, hypermarkets across. Okay. Um, and what's the saving if that were to happen? It probably will happen. I see, uh, actually I was watching, and well, you would not have seen it, it was on BBC the other day, Food Unwrapped, where the delivery is now done by robot. And it's just fascinating to see it. The people just found it nicer and easier, less hassle to have this little thing, little trolley, come up to their door, goes beep, beep, they take it out, and it beep, beeps off again. Well, yeah, exactly. And, you know, like the, the humans are also going into a different phase in, you know, they could do the industry 4.0 and then it, now it's industry 4.5 or whatever, or oh, 5. I must and have then, missed something there. I didn't know. We well, they, they, they're talking about it in the robotics. But basically, you know, humans are going into like a, a like a phase where they don't want to do all these shitty jobs. You know what I mean? And like anybody that says, oh, but they're going to take the jobs. It's like, OK, have you ever worked in that job? You know what I mean? It's like so, coal miners. I mean, good. God, yeah. the work they had to do. Yeah, yeah, it's not a nice job. So no. it's like, uh, and then I think also, you know, I think I think the the work week will will decrease. So it won't be five days that we're working; it'll be four days or something. I'm sure that's. We've already done an item on the four day week on this very podcast. Yeah, and I think it is happening. Yeah, and so then robots are there to replace the fifth day, right? <laughs> so you dream. <laughs> what else? Say that you and you presumably you will actually crack the large supermarkets and that you'll get all your robots. Where, where will you manufacture your robots, actually? 
we'll probably do them in house. Um, I mean, in house up in, 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 in Denmark. In Denmark. Yeah. So both. So I have two investors, uh, Niels, the person I already mentioned, and Enrico. Enrico is um, a CEO of uh, another big huge uh, international company called Universal Robots and they bo- both of them manufactured the robots in-house so they both have experience doing it. You know, the, the our robot is not that complicated from the perspective of how many components go into it. It's mainly, you mainly want to have control over the testing of it um, so that, you, you know, so that it doesn't kill anyone, you know. I, you know, I was thinking as you were saying that, I wonder who gets to blame this is like a Tesla question. If a robot in a Tesco runs me over, do I ring you up and uh, get my lawyers onto you because you're, you are the robot keeper? So there are safety standards that you follow. And if you follow those, so it's all about how you, how you, uh, you, you know, you write it in your user guide or your, your agreement with your sales. So there's safety standards and then you have to follow them and then you have to just prove that you've, you know, keep the data to show that you've tested it according to that. So, it, you know, it's, uh, and then, you know, you have to see, was it misused and different things like that. So it would have to be analysed. But Now, people like you are always looking to the future because you've obviously thought about this when you were in college and all. Where do you think that you, not the world, just that you would go with robots in the future? Say that you raise your cash, that it all goes swimmingly, you probably have a team built, there'll be hundreds if not thousands of people working for you, you'll probably be on your Caribbean island <laughs> stroking the cat, you know that whole thing. Yeah, yeah. But where do you think you would like to be and with your robots, what will you be doing with robots at that stage? Um, I think that, uh, you know, you reach, you, you reach uh, the, uh, like, so a company grows through different stages and I would like I like the I like the chaos of not knowing what is coming up so I think that when the company reaches a stage where it's much bigger and then it's more about like the nitty gritty things I would say I wouldn't like I w- it wouldn't be me you professional know? management moves in yeah and Fiona Martin moves out exactly to do what um I would say that I'd probably like become an angel investor and advisor like so reinvest uh, into robots and robotics yeah, like I think so because that's what I know, you know, but I would also invest in other things because I think like art and things like that are underinvested. So, you know, I'd kind of split it, try to make the money through the tech and then invest it into other things that don't. I was uh, a stockbroker once and I'll give you some advice. <laughs> Art is not a good investment. No, but I know. But so you make the money from the tech and then you Oh, put that's it. okay. If you, if you love your art, that's fine. And what will your robots do? Not the ones that you're currently using. What will your future robots do for me, for us, for the world? What will they do for... Uh, Just wondering, you know, what, what do you think that they will very soon will be doing? So robots in general, not my robots. That's what I'm saying. Well, your future robots, your... The ones that you will be inventing in the future. Okay. Like they already make our cars, they're performing so surgery. She, you know. Yeah. So I, I, like, listen, listen, if, so basically, I've heard someone else, I forget where I heard this, but I think it's a very, very nice perspective on robotics. Basically, what people are trying to do at the moment is build robots to help the sick and stuff like that. But actually, the robots should help the people who are not sick, like, you know, younger people, so that they can help the sick because humans need human contact. So if you can reduce the work, so if these robots can you reduce the work for abled people, then those abled people can have that human contact with the people that are not abled anymore. And that makes an awful lot of sense because there was a big hoo-ha, wasn't it, in Japan where the carers, so-called, were robots. It was a bit odd that who'd want a robot going into granny or anti or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so you have that focus now as well that people are focusing on helping the sick, but it's like, no, help the people who are not sick. And then okay, they, I like that idea. Uh, now, a couple of last questions. If somebody wants to give you eight or ten million, have you made up your mind exactly how much you want? Or when will you I make mean, up I mean, I always want the higher number, right? Ten million. <laughs> say ten million. If somebody wants to give you ten million, what kind of person do you want? Now, I don't mean uh, tall, blue-eyed or whatever. <laughs> Is that you're looking for smart money. People who know the business yeah. or people who are in what industry? I think you need to, you need, like, you need to, well, retail would be nice, obviously. And then um, deep tech, uh, new tech as well, because I think um, we, like at the moment, we're creating the market, you know, so it's like a lot of technologies are following an already created market while we're creating it. So someone that's probably used to doing that and uh, dealing with a lot of constant unknowns. 
One of those unknowns is the changing clock, because we've had some interesting issues around time differences between Odunz uh, yeah. and Dublin. I know, my laptop's in one time and my phone's in the other, so sometimes I'm like, ah, oh no. She was only two hours early for her interview, but there you go. Final, final question, Tina Martin, is who would you hire in a heartbeat? Oh, yeah. So I have that one. Uh, Chin- <laughs> I would hire uh, this Nigerian writer called Chinwamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, and why? Because uh, I think communication is probably one of the the things that causes the most problems in the world. And she's, uh, she's a very good writer and very, uh, very, like she reads history and everything. So she's well informed and is very good at... Now, remember, she's meant to be helping you on your robots. What, she, what is she going to do with your oh, robots? She could convince anyone to do anything. Oh, one of because, those ones, yeah. Because she just has a, you know, like the capable, like she knows language. Away so you with could, words. Yeah, exactly, yeah. They're very special people. I love they're those. very special yeah. people, yeah. Okay. Uh, Kina, you're very kind to have driven, flown all the way from Denmark down to us in Dundrum here. And thank you so much. If anybody wants to contact you, it's CM. Are you honestly telling me CM is not for Kleena Martin Robots? No, actually it's not, but it's funny that it ended up that way. And some, a couple of people have said it to me and, you know, I ne- never even noticed it until people started saying, I was like, ah, uh, uh. ah, <laughs> maybe <laughs> it was just the way it was meant to be. And I said CM Robots, it's CM Robotics. Yeah. And you will find her on LinkedIn and other places like that if you want to give her eight, 10 million. You know, you're easy about it. You'll have <laughs> yeah. a chat if nothing else. Exactly. Kleena, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. Thanks very much for having me. That great business show. And that is it from that great business show episode 86 do please share this podcast with all of your connections on social media and do it now please before you forget a click of a button for you commercial success for us subscribe to us by pushing that subscribe button right now and don't be shy tell your pals to do the same talk to us on our linkedin page we like that advertise with us great brands like big red cloud microfinance ireland is me virgin media do already your business should too work with us we like being the world's best sounding business podcast that's why we are based here with our great friends at the dublin podcast studios including today's can do sound engineer davida murray you want it davida has got it podcast studio boss peter rice adds all those zings and stings that i love so much peter wants you to know that dublin podcast studios are open for business if you want to record a podcast check their new website and then have a chat with peter if you want the media group that's us to produce your podcast then talk to me please as always the great business insights you hear on that great business show are only made possible thanks to our sponsor the great makers of the world's best shaving oil De facto, made in Mayo, sold worldwide. And do not forget either to buy Business Plus magazine, where we now have our regular column all about the podcast. So from me, Conal O'Moran, we're 